Okay, we are live. Hi. Welcome to Facebook. I'm Rosemary Barton, one of the hosts of The National. I'm in Toronto today for our special coverage of the midterm elections happening tonight. We will be on as of 8 p.m. Eastern on CBC News Network. Power and Politics will have uh, you covered until then. And then the CBC, The National, will do rolling shows throughout the country starting at 10 Eastern, 1030 in Newfoundland. But first, we thought we'd put uh, ourselves out here for you to see if you have any questions in the lead up. David Frum, who you all know well because he's uh, partly Canadian but has been <laughs> on our show many times, he will be joining us shortly. He's late, um, so he will come shortly. But in the meantime, Patty Solis Doyle, she is a Democratic strategist based in Washington. She is with us. And Jay Shabria, a Republican strategist based in Ohio, um, is here with us to talk a little bit about the night ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's just start with that while we wait for some of your questions. And if you have questions on Facebook, start firing away and we'll, we'll get to them. Um, I don't want to do predictions, but maybe expectations, Patty? What, how do you think the night is going to unfold? Well, I think uh, if the polls are correct, and we have no idea if they are, because <laughs> in 2016 they were not. We've been uh, fooled before. <laughs> we have been. <laughs> I think if the polls are correct and are any indication, then I think Democrats are going to have a pretty good night tonight. I think uh, we will win back the House. I think the Senate will be close. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Republicans may pick up another seat or two. But I think we're, Democrats are going to do really, really well in governorships tonight. Oh, really? Uh, which will be, uh, will have a huge impact on 2020. So why does that matter, the governorships part? Because the, like, lots of people are for, focused on Congress, but why was, would that matter for 2020? It matters for two reasons. Yeah. One, redistricting. Uh, governor, Democratic governors will have the opportunity to veto uh, the gerrymandering maps. Uh, even if you don't have the state houses, a Democratic governor can veto the map. And uh, it matters significantly for 2020. Uh, you know, state houses have a great impact on the state's elections. Yep. Um, so so uh, if we have more Democratic governors, that will be helpful to a Democratic 2020 nominee. Okay, and where we can, too. yeah, yeah. And Patty's absolutely right. I mean, I, I mean, I kind of agree with where, she, where she's seeing this going tonight, but again, we don't know. But governorships are important, too, because that's where the farm team is built. That's where the leaders of 10 years from now are going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, Republicans have done significantly better in the state houses uh, all across the country for the last 10, 15 years, right. and we've had more talent coming out yep. because of that. Um, so if, if Democrats are able to get eight to nine uh, governorships, that's a big deal. Uh, and I mean, uh, this is a whole other Facebook Live we could do about gerrymandering, because it sort of blows Canadians' minds, I think, to know that uh, elected officials are able to draw the districts to their benefit. That's not how we roll here. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's a little, it's it's a little strange. It's not how we should roll in the U.S. No, either, well, but unfortunately we It do. is. Okay, yeah. uh, Bernard Leckler asks our first question. Just wants to know if you guys have voted. Yeah, I voted last week because I knew it was going to be out here, so I, I absolutely voted. You did it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I voted last week on Halloween with my husband <laughs> and my dog. <laughs> <Again>. <laughs> well, let's talk about the voting then because voter turnout, it seems, if you believe, again, these are polls and sort of Democratic databases and stuff, uh, that there has been a big turnout, which is unusual mm -hmm. for the midterms. I think it was 36% back in 2014. Typically, Democrats also don't vote overwhelmingly mm -hmm. in, in midterms. What, how, do you, how will you know if it's a good night, or how well, important is that? Well, yeah. it's, 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 it's surging. There are 33 million people who have already voted. That's yeah. already more than who voted in 2014 in the 2014 midterm elections. So we know it's up. Um, what I'm looking for tonight is uh, how much higher young people voted, yep. how much higher women voted, how much higher African Americans and Hispanics, because that's really the coalition uh, for a Democrat in 2020. Um, and you know, the reason why is the reason is Donald Trump. He has really, I think <laughs> Donald Trump has motivated those groups of people uh, more so than let's say Barack Obama did, for a variety of different yeah. reasons, right? Um, but uh, there's, your, there's your Donald Trump silver lining exactly. for you, Patty. He has got people engaged. People yeah. Hispanics, <laughs> African-Americans, women, and young people. Yeah, yeah. So look, voting is absolutely high, but we actually don't know what that means right now. No. Um, early voting in America has kind of got a relatively, it's kind of a relatively recent phenomenon. So there's not a lot of history to go back into and say, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. What kind of data can we get out of this? So I think it means good things for Democrats, but I don't know that we're going to know until yeah. later tonight. 
what that actually means. Because it could be that you're just cannibalizing the vote that's already going to come out. So those types of things for early voting. Yes. Um, yep. And then a higher turnout, it could be that the base, uh, Donald Trump's base is coming out too. Mm -hmm. We don't know until later. Okay, there's lots of questions okay, coming good. in now. So that's good, everybody. I appreciate it. Somebody's watching. <laughs> um, Mike Dobson has, this is sort of what we were just talking about. Uh, this midterm is big for the House control, but is it a preliminary look at what the presidential 2020 could be? Which is hard to say because there's no Democratic candidate right now, right. but is it is it going to get foreshadow that, I guess, Jay Fred? It has an impact on it, certainly, because um, I, I think one of the things that we have to understand is that it, way back when America used to look at everything through the lens of the Kardashians, now we look at everything through the lens of Donald Trump and his White House. So he, when you, when <laughs> I he, never looked at it through the Kardashians, well, but anyway. You're, you're Canadian, you're Canadian. In America, we did. We, we used to look at the E, yes, e every okay. Sunday All right, night. Yeah. Um, so from that perspective, you know, Donald Trump is on the ballot. Uh, everything that's happening right now is, is a referendum, referendum on him. He wants it that way, too. Yep. So it does have some impact on 2020, but, I, but you're right. There's not a Democrat candidate right now. We don't know who the nominee is going to be, so it's not a full uh, story. Of it. It's hard to Can gauge. Can I just yeah. say the yeah. race for the 2020 Democratic nomination begins tomorrow morning. Well, actually, tonight, tonight around maybe, 2 right? or 3 yeah. o'clock in the morning. That's going to start. And you Like, know, we'll get a sense of who could be the candidates? It's just, yeah. well... I think every person who is thinking about running in 2020 on the Democratic side is going to take the, tonight's elections returns and pour over that. Right. What did Americans vote for? What did Democrats vote for? Did they vote for, you know, someone who's progressive? Did they vote for someone who's more moderate? Did right. they vote for someone of color? Yeah. And they're going to pour over it and see, you know, is this good is this for, this me good for me or not? Me. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's smart. Okay. Colin Lewis on Facebook asks, "Will the Democrats start impeachment proceedings if they take back the House?" So I saw Tom Steyer on on mm -hmm. CNN last night. He's one of the, he's a billionaire basically, Democrat who's been throwing a lot of money behind campaigns, talking about impeachment, but also talking about it from sort of a moral perspective. How likely do you think it is that Democrats will actually take a step towards that process? They sure haven't talked about it much during the midterm. You know, there's a lot of emotion and visceral visceral emotion towards Donald Trump on behalf of the Democrats, but I think they make a huge mistake if they jump to impeachment just because they have the House. Mm -hmm. I think they have to wait for the Mueller report. I think they have to see if, you know, Donald Trump has committed high crimes. Um, but uh, because there's an opportunity, there's a real chance of overreaching. I mean, you know, yeah. Republicans overreached with Clinton when yeah. he was impeached. So I think for Democrats, we stand a better chance to beat Donald Trump 20, in 2020, you know, legitimately and not by yeah. trying to impeach There's probably lots of damage they can try and do to the president without having to go into impeachment. Probably. Yeah, right? this, this is a really interesting question, right? Uh, because the Democrats, I, look, I, I, I've been saying this for a long time. Both parties are completely broken. I think there is a pull from two factions of each party to, to try to get them to uh, believe in the policies that they want. There is certainly a faction of the Democrat Party that wants to start a meet peace proceedings yep. as soon as they take office. Yep. And how strong will whoever be, whoever's the speaker, I happen to think it's between Nancy Pelosi and Patty and I were talking last night, she doesn't, she doesn't know that <laughs> it's going to be, but um, how, how strong are they going to be in the face of that pull? to appease their base and that's going to that's going to have a huge impact on 2020 whatever happens there. And you think Nancy Pelosi won't be speaker again? I think there's going to be a push a for change. Push for yeah. change. Yeah. I would yeah. agree with you too. And why do you think that is? Cuz she represents something she's been the there a long yeah. time. Not that yeah. she's not an extremely effective speaker. Yeah. She is, but I think that given where we are now in the political terrain, there is a call for change. There is a call for someone younger. There is a call for someone more progressive. There is a call. There is just yeah. a call. Yeah. Uh, Vebs Saini, I'm sure I'm not saying your name right, Vebs, but do you think Beto could be a 2020 Democratic nominee? I do. Well, he's got to win. He's, <laughs> he's got to win, win, right? Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I, mean, I think that's the That's first where thing. I disagree. If he wins, I don't think he will run because I think it goes against his brand completely and totally. He has said he's not going to run if he wins, and I don't Everyone think Everyone says it's against their brand. I think it could change. Until, until I think it could change. Yeah. Let's, see, let's see him win I first, too. I'm very skeptical. That's hard to turn down. Off. I think there's yeah. a bigger chance he will run for president if he loses, frankly. Do you think, you think he's going to win tonight? I do. Yeah. She's been saying it for she's been consistent on this. Beto is, is running against Ted Cruz, just so everybody mm -hmm. knows. And but his numbers have been slipping a little I bit. Don't, right? I, look, I, don't I think know. Texas is still a very hard state. Yeah. Um, certainly there's I mean there's Beto's numbers have been slipping. Yeah, not right, Ted exactly. Cruz. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I still think Ted Cruz is gonna pull that one yeah. out. But um, if if it, if, if, you win, if Beto wins it, I'm gonna I'm buying a Oh, oh, again, he's <laughs> surged in early voting in Texas. He's raised a lot of money, he has a national presence, he is, you know, 
beloved. Uh, you know, he's turned out to be the star of this election. It's, yeah, it's interesting. So, I had never heard of him before the midterms, exactly right? Either. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, like Barack Obama. Yeah. Heard of Barack Some Obama. might say the liberal media likes to make stars. You know, Some <laughs> might say, like to say that. I, like, I like to make conservative <laughs> stars too. Um, okay, just so we, you know, we are standing by waiting for David Frum to arrive. Hopefully, he'll get here before the Facebook Live is over. Um, if not, he will be on the show later tonight. So don't don't worry, anybody. Uh, Allison Barkley on Facebook asks, and I get this question a lot on on Twitter myself. Voter suppression is a big issue in this election. What can be done to help curb it in future elections? We have a little bit of this um, in Canada, certainly. We, we've had some instances of robocalls, um, not helping people get out as opposed to encouraging them to get out. Do, do you see it in a big, play out in a bigger way? We've seen examples of it in Georgia, I guess, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, it, does, it, does it worry you? Do you think there's something more that could be done? Yeah, we have to elect Democrats in these state house races. <laughs> you know, that's what we have to do. For for a very long time, the Democratic Party, you know, sort of uh, turned their back on state house races. You know, we didn't put any investment in it. We didn't put any money in it. We didn't put any star power behind them. And we are paying the price. We're paying the price in gerrymandering, and we're paying the price in voter suppression. And you bring up Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the state attorney is a candidate in that yes, governor's yes. race and yet he's in charge yes that's also of crazy the election yeah. which is ridiculous so, so i'm going to take a, a little bit of a different tact i think the, i think the conservatives uh, republicans always talk about voter fraud and there's very few cases of that and i think they're and democrats always talk about uh, voter suppression and i don't think that there's that many examples of that too both are wrong both shouldn't happen but i think they're more, more rare than people like to say well, I hope that's right. I, but I, I do. Th I mean, while it seems that there's a big voter turnout th mm -hmm. in this in this election, it does also seem as though there are attempts to try and keep people at home or make it more difficult for them to vote. And I don't blame either party for that. I think that happens on all sides. Um, so, how do people in the U.S. You know, if you get to the polling station and they say, "Oh no, we don't have your name here," is there any recourse for them? There There's is, always right? Recourse. There's yeah. always recourse. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's very well publicized. It's and, and certainly there are monitors. For both parties have monitors, making sure that stuff yeah. doesn't happen, yeah, right. doesn't happen. So you know, it, it doesn't happen, in my opinion, as much as people like to make it out to be. Well. I agree with you on voter fraud, but voter of suppression. Of course you do. Right? On voter, uh, but not on voter suppression. Again, let's take Georgia as an example. Um, this is Stacey Abrams' uh, race versus where, Brian yeah, Kemp. Yeah. Brian Kemp, the city attorney general, you know, threw out fifty thousand people <laughs> off the voter. But but that's following the law, though. Too, it's about it's it's not throwing people off the rolls. It's people that haven't voted in a long time. And no, it's people who, you know, Patty Salise Doyle. If I spell my name with a hyphen. Yeah. But the hyphen wasn't in the role. Hi, David. Hello, hello. Oh, no, no. Hello, David. Here. here he is. Nice David's here. David Frum is here. It's good. Thank There's you. lots of questions already, David. So don't okay. worry, and there'll be lots more. Okay. <laughs> Here's David. I won't. I won't throw the first one at you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, okay. You catch my Jorge, Jorge Luis asks. Uh, I'll weigh in on this one too. Uh, for Canada in the short term, what would be the best outcome regarding Canada's economy? That's a, oh boy, I don't even know what that is. That's a David Frum question. That's actually David Frum. Damn, David Frum. I can take a stab at it too, but you go first. Um, uh, well, one, one of the concerns that Canada has coming out of this election is uh, protectionism is creeping up within the Democratic Party too. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was not only Donald Trump, for example, as opposed to the Trans Pacific Partnership. It was. Uh, Bernie Sanders. Yep. It was Hillary Clinton was in favor of it in the hardcover edition of her book, but against it in the softcover. Edition. <laughs> <laughs> That's really you were both. I just, I just, I just, I just, I just funny. went to the index. Um, <laughs> and and uh, um, I mean, so, it, it, and when you look at a lot of the um, Democratic candidates with real promise for 2020, um, it's the, probably the ones that are most electable. Uh, or have the most protectionist views. Sherrod Brown in Ohio, for example, York. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Canada and America's friends generally, um, what do they want from the United States? They want open markets, predictable leadership, yes. um, and they, they want um, financial decisions that are made conscious of the fact that America is not is not just some big Denmark, but it's, it's a world leader. And so when America runs promiscuous deficits, um, you know, irresponsible fiscal policy when it runs a selfish currency policy that destabilizes the whole world. And so, um, you know, it's, it's going to be tough for everybody because how do you find people in the United States? Right now, I think a lot of Americans are not in the mood for world financial leadership. Yeah. 
my answer was just going to be, I think Canada wants stability, yeah. uh, wants to know what's coming, uh, and, and, and wants a freer trade, which I'm not sure it's going to get after tonight. It'll just be sort of more of the same. Uh, Mickey Von Bros uh, asks, hypothetically, if the Democrats fail to take seats away from the Republicans tonight, it's hypothetically. Patty, don't. It's not a real thing yet, Patty. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you feel would need to change in strategy for 2020? And so I guess another way of asking that question, when they're watching tonight, if they see mistakes being made, states being lost, what they should have picked up, how will that inform what Democrats do going forward? Well, that's a really tough hypothetical for me because I think Democrats did a lot of things right this time around. They sort of learned from the 2016 election and the mistakes that were made there. Um, what did they do right? What was a good example of that? Well, first of all, engagement from the grassroots end, right? So we, from the day that Donald Trump was inaugurated, there was organ, there was just people got organized, Democrats got organized, there was a, you know, women's march which had millions of people across the country. Uh, groups started sprouting up like Indivisible yeah. who really uh, taught civic engagement. How do you call your senator? How do you call your member of Congress to say you're not happy? How do you go out and yep. vote? Uh, very basic steps which we did not do in 2016. Um, also, the big lesson was we ran candidates that um, really spoke to the districts that they were running in. Uh, Hillary Clinton, I worked for her for a very long time. I admire her in many ways, but she was a flawed candidate. So I think uh, we learned that lesson quite well. We, we ran really good candidates. Um, so if we don't end up at least picking up the house tonight, uh, I don't know what we're gonna do, frankly. Just burn it down and start again, Patty. <laughs> can, I, can I add a PS to this one? Yes, please I'm do. about in sort of more cosmic way. <laughs> um, that uh, one of what has been true since election day 2016 is that the um, Trump dissenting energy on the left has flowed into conventional politics. All the things you described, mm -hmm. recruiting candidates. To, if the Democrats don't break through, um, then I think there will be a lot of disillusionment with the kind of politics you do. Um, and people will be saying, well, maybe the streets are the answer. And through the past two years, Donald Trump has been, has been hoping for a 1969 like protest movement, that would be the greatest resource he could have. He wants to play Nixon. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're just saying so people would say the system is broken. Therefore, yeah. do extra political protest. Right. Um, and that that is the thing Donald Trump has been yearning for for two years. Oh. So t one of the things that tonight is a test of is does the system work, um, and will people who are of democratic mindset will they play within the system? put their energies there and not into other forms, other directions that might be more, less productive. Wait, what do you think of that, Jay? Well, that's a really interesting point, and I've never thought about what David's saying, and I, I'd like to see that. I hope that doesn't play out, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Know, right. But, um, but, but one thing I would say, though, if the Democrats fail tonight, it will And what is fail in your mind? They don't into, capture the House? They don't capture the House. I right. think that is, that is the expectation right now for everybody. Right. If they're not able to do that, it will mean that the Republican brand of machine politics is working when all of us thought it wasn't for two election cycles. And we have to really rethink all of us political professionals and saying, everything is, we have to throw everything out and those guys know what they're doing. Because there's been a, a large sense by most people, establishment Republicans and, and elite Democrats that the Trump team doesn't know what they're doing, yeah. and this will change things a little bit. Okay, and we're, we're, we're going to do probably 10 more minutes, I think, Natalie. Natalie, my producer downstairs. Uh, so if you've got any questions, still fire away. But let's, let, let me put that question to both of you. If, let's say, uh, the, the, the most likely scenario, the Republicans hold the Senate, mm -hmm. um, does that uh, embolden Donald Trump? Does it confirm to the Republican Party that they're, that they're doing fine, that they can continue on this path? What, what does that... What does that What do you mean by hold the Senate? Because the likely, it seems to me, if you're just reading the conventional views, yeah. the likeliest definition to hold the Senate is 50-50 with Vice President Pence. Right, so not a great time. win. So that's, you know, you, uh, that means every time you need to confirm a U.S. attorney or a judge, Mike Pence has to come down to the Senate. Okay, that, so, right. so, so let me ask the question uh, in a more straightforward way. If they, if, if they can 
What would be a win for Donald Trump tonight? I guess is Anything the question, right? Anything that happens right? tonight, he's going to claim victory. <laughs> Whatever happens tonight, he's going to claim victory. The biggest victory. The ever. biggest victory <laughs> ever. <laughs> if, if, if Democrats take the House and the Senate and all the governors, Donald Trump will say, it's not my fault, it was Speaker Ryan's fault, it was Mitch McConnell's okay. fault. So whatever yes, happens, I, yeah, tonight, I, and I get it, and that's his personality. But but what in actual, if Republicans are looking at it and they say, oh, he did this right or wrong, what what would they look at tonight to well, see that? Well, I, I think it's very hard. There are so many things. Look, when you have all the poker chips, <laughs> um, any that spill off over the top of your pile are a loss. So the Repub here are the things the Republicans have to worry about: the House, of course. Um, because the loss of the House means that Adam Schiff replaces Devin Nunes as chair of the Intelligence Committee, and so you get someone who actually cares about finding out what Russia did in 2016 <laughs> instead of a Donald Trump defense attorney. Yep. Or you, if you lose the Senate, um, then suddenly appointments and confirmations become much more difficult. That means Donald Trump really cannot fire Jeff Sessions uh, because the hearing, the Jeff Sessions replacement hearing, whoa. And, and the last I hadn't thing, thought about that. Uh, yeah, and the last thing that uh, they have to worry about is governor's races because Republicans have had a grip on state level unlike anything seen since the 1920s um, and uh, we the United States has a census coming up in 1920 followed by a redistricting yeah, yeah. and if the Republicans suffer losses uh, the, what was so the, the politics of the past 10 years have been defined by the Republican successes in the election of 2010 allowed them in 2011 to write the maps yes uh, if the we talked about this before you got here, but okay. keep going, okay. keep going. But, so no, but you keep start going. losing yeah. at the state level, yeah. the Democrats get the ability to write the maps. And, and, right. and the Republicans in 2010 and 2011 set new records. There had been all kinds of things that no one thought you could do that they did. And the Democrats are going to say, well, maybe we should refrain because that was such a bad example, or maybe we should learn from the bastards. <laughs> <laughs> the like, the just an aside, the when, when is the United States going to stop doing that? It's insane. There, there are there are pushes to do it. Stop doing it. No, no, no. There, there are, there's, there's legislation like in, in my state of Ohio yeah. for the, for state legislatures in 2020. Uh, it's it's going to be a different pr uh, process where it's going to be much more fair. Neutral. Yeah. And, and then it's also going to be the same for the congressional races too. So there are places in in the country that 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 people are finally saying we might lose, and then we're going to lose the uh, yeah. district yeah. lines. Yeah. Well, I would say before the appointments of. Uh, Kavanaugh and Gorsuch was the Supreme Court could you know the Supreme Court up until now has not has well, refused to her to even hear the case yeah. they may hear it now but given the the, the, the makeup it the won't makeup, go anywhere yeah okay yeah, Amir Amir Bedjikian this is always the part of Facebook lives that I'm worse at how can this election affect foreign policy of the United States say regarding Iran or sanctions which were put back in place uh, yesterday anyone want to weigh on that line um, Feels like a David question. Typically, when presidents do badly in Congress, foreign policy gets more adventurous uh, because they say, okay, here's one place uh, where I can be president still. And what would more adventurous yeah. look like for Donald Trump? <laughs> well, Donald Trump has not been a very adventurous foreign policy president. Um, that he has been conflict averse, risk averse, I mean, and um, not deployed a lot of troops, yeah. um, not made a lot of big moves. Uh, partly because he's not interested in the world outside the boundaries, partly because of whatever hold the Russians have on him. Um, but it looks like, if you just look at it uh, superficially, it looks as though he's made some big moves, whether it be with Iran or North Korea. Rhetoric, right, or rhetoric, 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 yeah. But right. compared to, compared yeah, to, no, exactly. Never mind George W. Bush. Compared to how much Barack Obama reoriented Mm -hmm. Trump's foreign policy is more continuous than Barack Obama's than Barack Obama's was with George W. Bush. Mm. Okay. Uh, Dwayne Paul J. Murphy asks, I don't know who's going to be able to do this one, maybe not you guys, do you think that left-wing progressive populism within the Democrats can be replicated within the NDP in future elections countrywide in Canada? You guys probably know. can't do well, that I, one. I, I, no. I have a clue. Okay. Sorry, can I? You shouldn't. Um, <laughs> let, let me... The short answer is, I think on the Canadian left is, is not very much like the American left. No. And this, this is not my the dream. The American left is very left. Okay, but here's the difference. The, the American left is a, um, has to balance two things, which okay. is uh, the incredible importance of African Americans to the Democratic Party. And African Americans are not left. They are party regulars. They, uh, they are people who believe in the Democratic Party as an institution. Um, they're very pragmatic voters. Uh, and they are concerned with real meat and potatoes mm -hmm. issues. And what has happened in the past 
last few cycles is you've seen the rise of a college-educated, non-African-American, multi-ethnic, but some, I don't want to say exclusively not it, but, yeah. mu but uh, multi-ethnic, college-educated left is much less focused on meat and potatoes issues and much less regular, much more willing to desert the Democratic Party. Um, Canada doesn't have the equivalent of no. that African-American people who are committed to the Democratic Party's institution and say, I, I don't want to hear about all kinds of large schemes. Um, you know, we are, uh, we've had some betterment, we're more economically marginal, we, you know, we can't afford a lot of experiments. Mm -hmm. You yeah, agree with that? I, I agree with that, but I, I don't know whether at the end of the day, and as I said earlier, 2020, the fight for the Democratic nomination is going to begin on Wednesday morning, tomorrow morning, or, you know, by 4 a.m. today. I don't know if the progressive left, if the, the really left part of the party is actually going to, because of everything you just said, actually going to rise and be... You know, we're going to have a progressive left as our nominee. I, I, I don't mm. know if well, they have the support. I think a lot of the future that depends on whether African-American voters are able to discipline those people and kick some sense into them. And it's not just African-Americans, it's Hispanics. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, you know. yeah. Okay, uh, we're going to take no more questions. We're going to wrap it up. We're going to leave it on one thought before we see you guys later at 8 p.m. Eastern on, on your TV or live streaming. We're live streaming too. So one thought. Um, let's, let's end on this. What, what, is the, what is the one thing you're going to look for tonight to know how it's going to turn? It can either be a district or a sign or voter yeah, so, turnout so the, or something. So the early races, uh, like Indiana is going to come, come back early, and, and that might give us a sense. Republicans feel good about it, and uh, but what happens there might start to tell you a little bit about what's going to happen in the rest of the country. So that's that's a good place to start, I think. Okay. How about you? Uh, I agree. I, I would add Kentucky. Kentucky's Kentucky. Kentucky. Mm -hmm. closed, the polls close at yeah. 6 p.m., so we'll know early. There's a, there's a toss-up race there. Kentucky, 6. Uh, uh, female fire pilot uh, Amy McGrath versus mm -hmm. Andy Barr. Um, if she pulls that out, the Democrat, I think Democrats are looking at a pretty good night. How about you, David? Pay attention to the Florida governor's race. Um, this is a race that, it's a local race, of course, about local issues, but it got nationalized and it got racialized. And mm -hmm. the president at attacked the Democratic nominee, the president of the United States attacked the Democratic nominee for governor um, in highly racialized terms. Mm -hmm. And the question is, do, does that ignite a counter reaction among um, black voters and other voters um, in Florida, uh -huh. um, and tip Florida, which is normally quite a Republican leading state, away from uh -huh. the party of the president, or do Republicans hold on? And if the Republicans, if, if the Democrats do win the governor's race, I think that probably pulls the Senate seat after them. Okay, and I just realized none of us are wearing poppies because I saw that David Frum has poppy um, cufflinks. So that so uh, mine is on my coat. I'll make sure we all have them for the show Great. tonight. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> okay, thanks everybody. Thanks. We'll see you later. You. So 8 p.m. Eastern on CBC News Network, and then throughout the evening on CBC. Thank you. For those are beautiful. Nice. Bye everybody. Thanks. Those are really those, nice. Those are Br those are British poppies, though, not Canadian. Oh, they're oh, beautiful. Yes, they're very nice. And you guys do do poppies? No. They Americans? Don't, they no. don't even understand it. They don't know. Well, I mean, I've seen it, but I don't, yeah. I don't think yeah, I mean, I had, what's, what's the significance of the poppies? So it's for Remembrance Day to, to remember. Uh -huh.